Amy have been wonderful welcoming me and making me feel prepared for this event. And your introduction was so good. I'm, I'm gonna repeat some information. And I also see some familiar faces on this call, Robin, and um, also some familiar last names of upperclassmen I look up to when I was a student at St. John's, Fouch and Cock and Sims. So <laughs> it's great to be here and I really appreciate y'all having me today. Um, I actually graduated from St. John's in 2011. So I've spent a lot of time at, um, in that church and certainly miss, miss being there. Um, 2011 was actually also a really big year for search, and um, Kathy touched on this, but I wanted to kind of share with y'all an introduction, um, tracking our history and how our services came to be the way they are today, and then talk a little bit more specifically about our House of Tiny Treasures and um, the project y'all will be doing, which will be supporting the families there. So as Kathy said, when we started in 1989, we were a very basic needs focused organization. Um, we had laundry services, we had shower services, we had mail services for folks living on the street. All those things remain incredibly important um, and there are agencies in Houston still doing those, but in 2011, um, the different homeless services providers here in Houston and also the city and the county and other, other governmental departments came together in a strategic planning session. Um, they all collaborate through a system that's called The Way Home. It's the, our local continuum of care that handles the Department of Housing and Urban Development funding that the region gets um, to, to address issues of homelessness. And um, during those conversations, um, there was a lot of focus on how can we best use the resources that we have? How can each agency focus on our area of expertise so that we're really deploying the resources we have effectively, so that we're not duplicating services, so that we have a, a really well-established pipeline and coordinated system for folks um, living on the streets to receive services. And so search after that point really began to focus on case management. And that is, is primarily what we do now as an agency. Um, I like to think of our departments as kind of falling in three big buckets. We have um, an engage and stabilize bucket that houses our outreach team. So we do still have a street outreach team. They are primarily focused on the areas um, around downtown and midtown and they follow a model that's called progressive engagement. So rather than um, working really broadly and trying to reach as many folks as they can, they focus on returning to the same encampments, the same underpasses where they really get to know folks. So every Monday they're at the, um, they're at the area kind of near Minute Maid Park, y'all may be familiar with. Um, there's a fairly large area um, sort of group of tents there. Um, Every Tuesday, they're over by Pierce, under the Pierce Elevated, there tend to be folks sleeping. So um, it's really about building relationships and building trust. A lot of the people that we serve understandably have a feeling that America was not designed for them, the service system here in the States was not designed for them, and there's really a lot of mistrust that we have to overcome in order to um, encourage them to seek our help and get the support that they need. Our outreach team does, of course, also do some basic needs work. So for example, this coming winter, they will be collecting you know, blankets, gloves, things like that, and we'll be handing those out as well. Engage and Stabilize also includes our navigation department. So I'm sure y'all have all had the experience of even just navigating a move in on your own is complicated. You have to fill out all the paperwork. You've got to have all those identification documents. So the folks we serve, um, when they get ready to be housed, typically what that means is that they have come up to the top of the wait list um, for receiving a rental voucher here in Houston. Um, there's a lot of work to be done to get them ready to move into that apartment. So like I mentioned, getting them all the identification documents they need, as well as getting them those basic household essentials, things like towels and hygiene products, just to make sure they're in a good spot when they first move into their apartment. Um, one thing I wanted to mention that I think is really hopeful, um, as I said, unfortunately, there is a wait list here in Houston. There's, there's just not enough affordable housing to serve all the people who need it. Um, but um, in conjunction with um, the county and the city, um, this, we have received $65 million in um, funding specifically to address homelessness associated with COVID-19. Um, and so over the next five years, we've got additional funding um, to provide rental subsidies for 1,700 people and to provide um, temporary housing for 1,000 people. So we're really hopeful about that as we kind of anticipate a wave of homelessness here um, as a result of some of the unfortunate economic impacts of COVID. Um, I wanna turn now to housing. That's our, our biggest bucket. So um, as an agency, we like to say that we're here to make homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring. Um, and to make that non-recurring bit possible, we've gotta make sure that people have the supports they need once they move into housing to stay into that, in that housing. Um, a roof is just a roof when it comes down to it. 
And while it's super important to have that shelter, if we don't address the reason someone fell into homelessness in the first place, um, the biggest one we see is loss of job. It's about 35% of our clients report that as a precipitating cause. There's lots of others, domestic violence, substance use, um, mental illness. And so that's what our case management staff are there to do. They're there to provide wraparound support and make sure that those, those struggles and challenges um, have support and that people aren't falling back into homelessness. Our, our set goal as an agency specifically is that 90% of the people we serve stay in that housing that we've secured for them. Um, our case managers are doing everything you can think of. They are making doctor's appointments. They are helping people process health insurance claims. They are helping people find employment. They are helping people apply for federal disability benefits. It, it really runs the gamut. Um, Another really important thing that we do through our case management services is address the isolation that sometimes results from moving into housing. So one thing that's um, that sometimes a surprise to community members is how strong the community is on the streets. Um, anecdotally, our outreach team reports there's actually somewhat of a political system in some of the larger encampments. One of the encampments even has a mayor, so somebody that the encampment has elected to serve as a representative speaking with the city and other folks that come to talk with that encampment. So they really have a neighborhood there. They've got strong bonds with the people who sleep next to them. Um, they're protecting one another. And although most of our clients are you know, incredibly grateful for the roof that they get over their heads, they've also been torn away from the support network that they've known for years. And so one of the things we try to do um, is make sure that our clients have new chances to build community. And that's an area where St. John the Divine has really supported us. Um, we specifically have a program called Coming Home that is a fellowship-based meal program. And the whole point of the program is to remind the participants in that program that the city of Houston is here for them. We want them to be part of our community and to build relationships with both the participants and community members. So we typically have a large meal on Tuesday evenings where participants and folks like you join us. We sit mixed at tables and we just have a conversation. Conversation or that program, uh, we're just really great for the way St. John's has contributed to that program. Um, the last bucket is educate, and so I know um, that's the that's the bucket y'all's outreach activity will be supporting. Um, we do have a preschool, Searches House of Tiny Treasures, um, which serves 64 children ages two through five whose families have been impacted by homelessness in some way. Um, we just reopened on September 14th, which is very exciting. Like probably many of your workplaces and your children's schools, we've been closed since March, so. We're so excited to be back. Um, we've got all sorts of precautions in place. We've got masking, smaller class sizes, things like that. Um, it's a really amazing program. Um, and like Kathy said, if you come, you will be overwhelmed by how adorable and wonderful the kids are. They are just <laughs> my favorite thing about working at Search. They're amazing. Um, and you would not know the situation that they're in if you met them. They're the friendliest, um, most resilient kids you'll ever meet. But the program is, is designed to, um, to make sure that when they get to kindergarten, they are on par with their more disadvantaged peers. So typically a child impacted by homelessness will already be two years behind developmentally by the time they enter kindergarten, which is a terrible gap to have to overcome and is just only going to accumulate as they move through school. So um, the program is year round, um, Monday through Friday, we've got transportation for children who live in shelters to make sure they can get to and from the campus. We have art, speech and play therapy available um, we've got two meals a day, and then we have volunteers like y'all who come in to support the children through art enrichment activities. Um, we can't do stuff like that right now, but we definitely eagerly await um, the day when we can have volunteers back on campus. Um, the program is our most expensive by far. Um, it's $19,000 per year per kiddo, so the equivalent of a private school. But if you came to see the campus, you would understand why. Um, it is beautiful. It's, it's a Montessori style education and set up um, to really enrich the kids, all their senses. Um, and it's also a program designed to serve the whole family. And that is where y'all's outreach activity is really going to make an impact. We do have two case managers who office on site at the school. All they do is make sure the siblings and parents of our students have what they need to succeed. So it's a lot of employment, coaching with the parents. It's helping the siblings enroll in school and have school supplies. And typically, what we try to do is build community among the families we serve at the school. A lot of them are exiting some unhealthy communities um, and we want to make sure they've got a new healthy community with us. And so typically we would do a Thanksgiving meal on our campus. 
Unfortunately, this year, because of COVID, we're not going to be able to do that. Um, but we're so excited um, that through our partnership with y'all, we'll be able to give the families everything they need to have a Thanksgiving meal themselves, whether um, in shelter or at home. And um, we, uh, one thing that we know is really important, I know those of you who have children or have worked with children know that routine is just so important for kids in terms of structuring their days and making sure that they can stay on task and are happy. And, um, and so we really try hard to make sure that what the kids are learning in school is reinforced at home. And one of those things is family style dining and table manners. And so we all are really giving families a bonding opportunity um, providing for a Thanksgiving meal for them and a chance to cook together and make some memories together. Um, and I wanted to give a special shout out to Amy who has been incredibly thoughtful developing the project. Um, we, we've got a really culturally appropriate list based on some of the demographics of the families we serve. Um, she added, you know, cookware and a little dish towel and just has been a pleasure to work with and really made it something that um, will be a beautiful gift for our family. So thank you, Amy. Um, I, uh, I want to um, share some by the numbers and by the words. So I know sometimes it's really helpful to hear data in terms of quantifying search's impact. Um, so last year, we actually served uh, 3,119 clients, including 88 students at our House of Tiny Treasures. Um, that was with an agency budget of around $11 million. Um, we were able to house 305 folks last year, which is really exciting. So that's 305 people who found their home last year. In addition, we had about 600 more people um, who were still receiving services through our housing program. So once somebody is housed, we stay with them. Um, we provide them with services as long as they need. Um, we actually um, see a cost savings of $34,000 per person on average for every person that we house. Um, if you think about it, um, somebody living on the streets by no fault of their own is gonna be a consumer of taxpayer funded services such as ER services. Um, and those costs tend to go uncompensated. And so it's actually, um, more you know cost effective for us to provide someone with housing and to provide them with wraparound services keep them from falling into homelessness again um so that's a really effective argument i think for for the services that we provide um finally um to speak shell's outreach project um the united way of greater houston has a really awesome statistic that um for every one dollar you invest in the early childhood education of an at-risk child you'll see a 17 dollar return that's both in terms of that child's future salary and um, cost savings as that child does not have to interact with the criminal justice system and other things of that nature. So um, again, y'all are really investing in these, in these kiddos and these families and it, it makes a huge difference um, financially and emotionally for them. I also wanted to um, share some um, statements from our clients that kind of speak to our impact to close. And JC, you actually set me up perfectly with your theme for the year because I picked a I picked a statement that I thought really resonated with me as a person of faith who grew up in the church and I thought might resonate with y'all. So one of our clients said, search is a place of refuge and peace for me. I'm deeply grateful for every day on this earth and the opportunities now before me. Um, I also wanted to share this statement from a parent at Search's House of Tiny Treasure. So this is somebody who will be receiving one of those outreach kits that y'all will be putting together. Um, she says, it was support from people who believed in me that helped me turn my life around and give Zakari, who's her son, a better life. Um, finally, I wanted to end on a statement from one of our Coming Home graduates. Um, so like I mentioned, Coming Home is our adult fellowship program that St. John the Divine has been, has been really involved with. And um, this participant said, it was so much unconditional love. The fact that they know my name, I didn't feel like a stranger. Instead, I felt like family with my sisters and brothers, so much love. Um, I really like that because I think, um, as I mentioned, I grew up going to church and still do. And to me, that is exactly what Jesus calls us to do is to create that sense of community for each other and for um, the people we interact with. And reading that just makes me so proud to work at search um, and to work somewhere that it makes that feeling possible um, for folks. So um, I really do appreciate y'all taking the time um, to listen and, and your support of the outreach kit activity. I'm happy to stay on. I know y'all are going to play bingo and I don't want to um, stall the fun. That sounds awesome. But please feel free to put any questions in the chat and I will be more than happy to answer them. Um, or to, I don't know, JC or Amy or Kathy, if people want to go ahead and ask questions live, that's completely fine too. Whatever works for y'all. I think we can open it up to any questions if anybody has any questions right now. Thank you. It, um, if you guys don't want to say it, um, you can just put it on the chat and I will read it to Molly. Anybody have questions? I have a question. Ah, I'm Barbara Yoder. That oh. was a wonderful talk, wonderful program. 
Now, I'm always interested in people. So I'm curious why, what prompted uh, Molly to get interested in social work? Sure, that's a great question. Um, well, so I, um, as I mentioned in high school, um, I, I did go to St. John's and so um, uh, we had a program called Search Slam and Sandwiches. Um, and so that program we made uh, 300 sandwiches a week. That was when Search still did lar large scale meal service. And um, so I was, I knew of Search um, from a earlier age and I really felt um, invested in that mission. And then um, I went on to Vanderbilt where I studied psychology um, and religious studies. And for me, that intersection um, really called me to go into social work. I think um, my biggest takeaway from church growing up was to do unto others um, as you would have them do unto you. And I really have always felt like I wanted to live out my faith in my work. And so that's a big part of why I chose social work. And then with psychology, we learned a lot about trauma and trauma-informed care and how important it is to keep those things in mind when providing services. And so um, that motivated me to pursue it as well. And so I, I knew I wanted to come back to Texas. I'm very close with my family. And so I uh, went to UT and got my social work degree. And then I've been at Search ever since. And um, many of you may know when you when you get a master's in social work, you complete a practicum. And I completed mine um, at an agency in Austin that was housing first, which is the same philosophy search follows. So it means housing comes first and then we help you get sober. There's no strings attached to the housing. We know you need that stable foundation before you can turn your life around. And so having seen the success of that model, um, I knew that search would be a great place to work. And that has very much been true. Um, I also see a couple questions in the chat. I'll go ahead and answer. Um, Melissa, I will happily put my contact information in the chat for you. And um, Loretta, our House of Tiny Treasures is in the third ward. It is on Francis Street, uh, right by the Emancipation Park facility that opened a few years ago. Um, and we love being in the third ward. It's, um, it very much reflects uh, the community that we serve at the preschool. We have lots of students who live near the third ward, who go to Blackshear Elementary, which is the, um, the third ward elementary school after they graduate from our program. So it's a, it's a really nice spot and the campus is beautiful. Um, I know it's difficult right now, but would love to give any and all of you a tour um, when that's possible. I saw um, Cindy raise her hand. Cindy, do you, do you have a question? Yes, thank you, JC. And uh, thank you, Molly, and thank you, Amy and Kathy. Um, I think that outreach is probably one of the most important and certainly the most rewarding thing that the women of uh, St. John the Divine do. But um, you said in your, uh, in your overview that your goal is, and I think that you said 90 that for 90% of the residents to be able to stay in their homes, what is it now? Do you know? We actually, we hover right around 90. So um, we do oh. typically, we do typically meet that target. We Got have it. some programs. Thank you. We're, we're proud of it. It's, awesome. it's a lot of work. Um, we have some programs that are specifically designed to serve folks with higher needs. So, for example, we have one property that is specifically for housing folks with really severe substance use issues. So in some cases at that property, we tend to have a slightly lower retention rate, but we, we make up for it at some of our other properties. So it tends to average out at about 90%. And I'm sure y'all have heard um, heard it said that recovery is a journey and most people, if they're recovering from a substance use issue, it takes them multiple um, stints at a rehabilitation facility to make any substantial change. So we kind of operate from that assumption. We, we give second chances, but we are really trying hard to make that first chance a worthwhile one for the people we serve. Thank you, Molly. And it sounds like Search has hired the right girl for the job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I really do love working there. I absolutely drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> I have a wonderful team. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Do we have other questions, ladies? I'm watching anybody raise their hands. Okay, I think that is it. So I'm going to, Molly, thank you so much for thank you all so much. being really with us it. and sharing the information about Search. It's definitely a great organization. So Amy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Molly Connor. And uh, we really appreciate you helping us gain a deeper understanding of Search, its mission, and all that Search is doing to combat homelessness in the Houston area. At this time, Kathy and I, and JC and all of the ECW are grateful to be able to present you with a $1,000 grant on behalf of the ECW. Since we can't